the end of the run. But, yeah, hey, uh, the, the stick emo, for the record, he only used the stick during games. Okay. okay. <laughs> but anyway, it helped, as he as he said, uh, you know, it helped you pull a few balls out of your blank. Um, mm-hmm. he, he, but, but they all went for any advantage. Gene Upshaw would wrap his, before a game, he'd wrap his hands, his arms with, with tape and show them to the official, and the official would say, okay, that's legal. <laughs> then Upshaw would go in and untape them and then retape them with pads and then soak them under hot water and then come out with these two clubs on his forearms. It was semi-legal. Um, they did whatever that they had to do, and they played like madmen off the field and on the field, but they never did anything crazy dangerous. You know, like today, Plaxico Burris shoots himself in the thigh with a 9 millimeter Glock at a nightclub. You know, we can do without that. These guys never got busted. They never showed up in a police plot, or they'd punch out place glass windows. They'd do strip teases on bars. They drank their share. They smoked their share. They sped their cars too fast. They, they did some weird stuff. Um, they'd go straight from practice to the hotel, where the competition between the right side of the defensive line and the left side of the defensive line in practice spilled over into who could drink more Crown Royal as opposed to more Chivas and still walk out of there upright. Okay. But it all worked, and it never hurt anybody. Mm-hmm. And today's outlaws are more like really outlaws. So these guys knew how to play hard off the field, but they really loved to play hard on the field. Philippi- Phil Villapiano, the great linebacker, told me that when he got to the team, he couldn't believe it, but they used to win games because he could tell other teams were just kind of giving up yeah. in the second <laughs> half. It was kind of just like, don't hurt us, okay? We want to play next week. Just lay off. Philip Yard said, you know, he sacked quarterbacks or caught interceptions where he'd say to himself, why in the world did the guy throw me that? Or why in the world did the guy just go down as soon as I ran at him? And it was because the Raider image was winning as much as the Raider physical strength. Yeah, the mental game on top of uh, a brutal yeah. physical game. We're, well, talking, we're talking with author Peter Richmond. Uh, he's author of a great new book called Badasses, The Legend of Snake Foo, Dr. Death, and John Madden's Oakland Raiders. Back to a few more Raiders. One that always uh, struck me, uh, speaked my curiosity, was, was a man by the name of Otis Sistrunk. The great, the great Trunk. They call him Trunk. The great thing about Trunk was a lot of the players on those teams came from other teams that had given up on them because their attitude was, you know, they, they were either nuts like uh, John Matusak or they were just underachieving, and Davis would bring them in. But Sistrunk had never gone to college, played three years for the Norfolk Neptunes in Virginia in a minor league. And the L.A. Rams brought him out one year as cannon fodder for a, for summer. You know, they needed more bodies, and they brought in this guy, Otis Sistrunk, because somebody would seen him play in a minor league game and said, the guy is a hell of a defensive end. Shaved head, tough guy, and liked his, uh, liked his liquor. So they brought him into L.A., and Al Davis went down to L.A. during training camp looking for a defensive end. He was actually looking for Jack Youngblood. Mm. And he noticed this guy that nobody had ever heard of named Otis Sistrunk playing like a madman in a scrimmage. And so Davis goes back and he sends his, his personnel guy, Ron Wolf down to look at him. And Wolf says, I agree. This guy should have been a first-round pick, but they'll never give him up. So Davis makes a deal with the L.A. Rams, gives up a fifth-round draft pick. And this guy comes to t- shows up in the middle of camp in a dashiki <laughs> with a shaved head, smoking a big cigar. And Madden says to him, what position do you play? And Sistrunk says, what position do you want me to play? And Madden said to me after, we didn't know where this guy would come from. He could have come out of jail. He just showed up one day, and after one practice, he was like the best defensive end we had. And so in his first game, in his exhibition game in Baltimore, he, he killed everybody. And he was starting by the beginning of the season. And he went on to have an all-pro year. And he was on the Super Bowl line. And Trunk was this guy that only Davis and Madden could have come across. I mean, he was the perfect Raider. And then he was best known, as you know, for sitting on the sideline of a Monday night game. And Alex Karras saw the steam rising from his bald head and said, you know, no college? Oh, come on. He went to the University of Mars. <laughs> and, and I asked Otis about that. And he said, hey, it wasn't the cognac rising off my head. It was just steam. If you want to know me as a guy from the University of Mars, that's pretty cool. And he's doing great as we speak. He's managing the athletic facilities of an army base up in northwestern Washington, and he's on top of the world.
you know, and that's a lot of those stories in the book about these players. That it was kind of, uh, you know, if you looked at it on paper, like the, you know, the island of misfit uh, NFL players. But these guys, once they it seemed like it was their niche, once they got to the Raiders, it was like they were just another piece into the great puzzle that was those great Raider teams of the seventies. Well, the coolest thing about it is when you use the puzzle, is that every piece is interdependent on any other piece. And if you talk about teams now, you know, can Cincinnati get better because we've got Ocho Cinco and then T.O. comes in? Um, can Seattle get better after they trade, uh, you know, T.J. Hushmanzada? Uh, or or can, the, can the Patriots get better if we bring Dion Branch back? Or they're all like this, this big sort of free agent pool. But back then, teams did have to fit their puzzles together. And the Raiders fit this puzzle together for 10 years where they had misfits and, and brilliant guys and people from big programs, people from small programs, people from no programs who learned to love each other. And so it really was kind of this foxhole mentality. They really, they were really playing for the guy on each side of them. They, did, they didn't want to let, Sistrunk didn't want to let John Matusak down. Um, uh, John Vela didn't want to let George Bueller down. Tatum didn't want, at, want to let Atkinson down. Stabler didn't want to let Belitnikoff down and vice versa. And they became sort of this, this, uh, fraternity of guys, and the, there were a lot of fraternities. Kansas City had it, Pittsburgh had it, mm -hmm. Miami had it. But the difference with this fraternity is they had Al Davis at top, and Al said, I don't care who you are, I don't care what you do, I don't care what your sexuality is, I don't care if you're gambling, I don't care anything. I just want you to know that you're a raider, and if you're a raider, it's us against them. And all of these guys just said, I love that. It's <laughs> us against them. And that's how it happened. The puzzle fit. It was the perfect puzzle, and you couldn't get it anymore. The game's still great, but you couldn't get it anymore because of free agency and money. So why not celebrate when it was really fun? Because these guys, i got to tell you, when you write a book, you usually call somebody and get a phone number and then call another and get another. It takes like 40 calls to get phone numbers. These raiders... 40 years later, you call like three guys and they say, who else do you need? Oh, wow. And they've got all the numbers of everybody because they all still hang out at golf outings in the Raiders box. Whenever they're, they're on business in somebody else's town, they hang, they go on motorcycle trips. They're still their own best friends, and that's kind of cool. Oh, and, and you know, speaking of the us and them mentality, Al Davis was definitely in the trenches with his team, especially when dealing with NFL Commissioner Pete Rozelle. That, that wasn't exactly the most rosiest of uh, relationships. No, and, and it also inspired the Raiders, because when the, when the leagues merged in 76, uh, Davis was the AFL Commissioner. Um, the Raiders had, had put him there, and he was up against Rozelle. The leagues merged. Rozelle became the Commissioner. The AFL wanted Davis to be the commissioner because he was a pit bull. He actually wanted to get rid of the NFL. He didn't want to merge. Mm -hmm. So he went back to Oakland, and they gave him full reign. He eventually turned his little slice of the pie into full ownership of the team. But when he came back in the late 60s, the team said, here was a guy who was fighting for us. He wanted the upstart league to be the great league, and so we're going to follow that we know that he loves us, the underdog. And then, since he had been a great coach, both in college and, and in his three years with the Raiders, they knew they were being owned by a guy who was also a great coach. And so he'd come down to the field, watch practice, and then after the practice, take a wide receiver aside and say, well, listen, you're planting your foot wrong. You've got to be able to cross on your left foot to get that you know, room against the cornerback. And they'd listen to him because they knew he'd been a good coach. And then, as an owner, he gave them everything mm -hmm. they wanted. He was known. He once turned to Ron Wolf, his personnel guy, and said, let's never forget, you and I were never good enough to play this game. These guys were. We have to give them ultimate respect. And so the players immediately, upon arriving in Raider camp and putting on that uniform after having been with three other teams that didn't want them, they knew that they had an owner who was saying, I've got your back do whatever you need to do. It's us against them. And that spirit actually probably won them a lot of games. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even today, Al, Al is still out there making noise the last couple of years. I mean, yeah, the Raiders teams of today, the last few years, haven't been doing so hot. But he's still out there. He's still well in the thick of it. I mean, he's, out, you know, no spring chicken, but you can still see that he has a passion and a fire for it in his you know older age. Well, not only that, I did 
I was lucky enough to spend some time with him. Physically, he's infirm, but mentally, he's all there. He had some bad drafts. 